Hello again to everyone. Um, here I started and didn't even clean my glasses, so uh, I'll be talking while I'm cleaning my glasses. What a way to start, right? <laughs> uh, we are we are doing the second um, uh, two-hour session, and uh, this is not this this really does tie into every, uh, to the first session. Um, and uh, so before we get going here and really begin to dialogue and discuss, I just want to once again say that this meeting, of, which is a discussion forum, um, is without prejudice, explicitly without prejudice, under reserve, same thing, and it's under the blood covenant of Yehoshua bin Yahweh Hamashiach, commonly known as, or I shouldn't say commonly known, known by the world as Jesus Christ. So um, we're here to discuss today um, something. It's a free discussion. It's, it's each, each one of us giving our, our thoughts about what works for us. And it's not, a, um, it's not legal advice at all in any form or fashion. We're not offering legal advice. If anyone wants to have that, they, they all know where to go. If they want to have lawful advice, well, they can know where to go with that too, uh, if they know their creator. So, uh, <laughs> so anyways, what we're discussing today, there's been a lot of requests for how is a document structured? And why do we do the things that we do with documents? And I've got some... Because we can. Because we can. And uh, we have discovered through the years, through trial and error, and through um, mistakes, and we've seen what works, we've tested, and we have not been found wanting and in a lot of what we're showing here today. So um, uh, let's just get going here. Uh, if you see the first one, you remember the, the box that we, that we call the, the fiction matrix, and uh, it's square. Um, my understanding, and you need to check everything, go and do your own research. Um, if we mention something, go and check it out for yourself. If it's not so, come back and we can discuss it. And, uh, but what we have found is that the, that the style manual or the form manual for the United States um, um, Government Printing Office um, makes it very clear that anything in a box, a box meaning no rounded corners, um, anything in a box is not part of the document. So if you have some public, a servant, a public servant signed under the penalties of perjury and you find it's in a box, that's not part of the document. It's basically invisible to the document. Anything in a box is really invisible. Now what does that tell you about the world system? Okay, and I was thinking about this just coming over here. I was talking a little bit with Joe about it. Um, you know, we've seen around the world in 80 days. You know, we've read the book or we maybe have seen the movie or the remake of the movie. Well, this is not a world that we're standing on in space. This is, a, this is the earth, and the earth is round. The world is the system that tries to, tries to make us think that we're standing on the world, but we're standing on the earth. And the earth is round, but the world is square. The one world government is a fiction. <coughs> Everything about the world is a fiction. And I was mentioning this last night, you know, uh, before we get into the documents, I just want to quickly review a little bit in a, in a different perspective. Uh, those that know the scriptures, they can understand this. If you don't, that's okay, you can still understand it. What we have here is we have evil and we have good. Okay? Or we have the creditor and we have the debtor. And this is the whole fiction system here. Well, if you go back to the Genesis account, if you look at that, that compilation of, of letters and books, 66 of them commonly uh, referred to as the Bible, <clears throat> look at that as a commercial document, manual for living life here in, on this earth in a world but not being of the world. All right? It's not, this is not life. There was two trees in the garden among all the other trees. There was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
good and evil, okay? That doesn't bring life. There was another tree outside, uh, and what we're looking at is outside this world system, and this is the tree of life. <clears throat> we, as living souls, live outside this system. But the system of knowledge of good and evil, creditor and debtor, debit and credit, it, it doesn't matter whether you're on the good side or the, or the evil side, you're still a debtor within this system. You're a fiction. So that's, that's just a little tidbit of my thoughts. And, um, but when you, come, when you come to know your Creator, you come to know who you are in Him, the Almighty, and you can come to know who the Almighty is in you. That we live and move and have our very being in Him. And, um, but let's start getting to the document now that I've thrown, the, thrown those tidbits out here. All right. We're looking at a document here. Let's say that this is the document. I'm using blue. I hope that stands out okay. All right. And I'm just going to, and feel free here. Um, Scott and, and Joe and Walt to throw in here. Uh, let's start at the top left of the document. If we're talking about a common law document, okay, there's a flag. And whatever flag, we look at this document as a vessel on the Sea of Commerce. All right? Anything that has the flag, any vessel that is flying a flag, that vessel is under the law of that flag. Sometimes people ask, why are you putting the flag up here on the left-hand corner? All right, Joe, go ahead and make mention here of um, why, why is it to the right if you're facing from the, and why is it to the left if you're facing this way? Uh, Joe, you probably need to step up here. Joe gives a very good, this is, this is the one that goes by Joe Darlock. <laughs> Excuse me, David. Yeah. The uh, <clears throat> anytime you're working with a uh, a piece of paper that intends to go out into the sea of commerce, this entire the document becomes a vessel in commerce. All vessels have got to be flagged. You can't put a vessel out onto the sea without a flag on it so that the other vessels out there know where it comes from. The reason it's flagged is, if you'll go to the very end of the Constitution of the United States, there is a sentence in there that says, and this Constitution on all treaties will be the supreme law of the land. Words to that effect. Treaties follows Constitution. The last words on the document down here take control and precedence over everything. Take authority over everything that goes before. So the back of this document on the right hand side is the real controlling signature on this document, but you don't see it. So what we're dealing here in is fictions and fantasies. Everything that's right side up is upside down. Everything that's right is left. And it's Right changes to left, left changes to right, up is down, down is up. On his back, back. And isn't it curiouser and curiouser and curiouser, as Alice in Wonderland said? <clears throat> Lewis Carroll wrote a book called Alice in Wonderland, and it was all about these fictions. He couldn't come right out and say that the Crown and the peers and the attorneys, et cetera, that were operating in commerce were doing something fictitious and really illegal when it comes to, uh, to understanding it in terms of truth. And so he wrote a book called Alice in Wonderland, and as David has there, he puts the line in front of, or in between the, the project here. Everything over here is fiction. Everything over here is truth. Alice was here. But she had to come over through the looking glass, and she did it by eating little bits of cake and drinking little drinks and what have you. She got herself over into the fiction side, and what did she run into over here? She ran into the Red Queen. She ran into the Mad Hatter. 
she ran into the hare and the Cheshire cat. And all of these uh, so-called beings or uh, what were real in this fiction side were truly fiction. They said funny things. They, the Red Queen put out crazy edicts. Everything and uh, almost everything she knew was off with her head, off with her head, to which Alice would reply, nonsense. <clears throat> she didn't understand it because this is where her brain and her upbringing uh, started. So in coming through this looking glass, she ended up on this fiction side. When we enter commerce, this is what we're doing. We're entering the fiction side. And over here is the Red Queen and her minions, only they wear black robes over here that we, we well know of. And so this fiction side is what we're dealing with. Now, how can we be in the world, but not of the world? And this is something that's, of course, addressed in Scripture, and it's going to be addressed in almost everything we're doing. We cross that fiction line. The same thing happened with Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. Instead of going through the looking glass, she was carried off in a tornado and still ended up in a fiction world where these fictional characters lived that she had to interact with. And while she was there, they're very real to her. And as you know, if you spend any time in jail or whatever, you find out that these people are very real and they have very real power in this fiction world. How do you maintain control in this fiction world? Well, this is part of it. It's, again, knowing who you are, and you're going to send off this fiction, fictional... Uh, this fictional... Uh, document into commerce. And so for the purposes of the discussion, this is a vessel in space. It's flagged, and you're going to put words on it. And those words, for the purposes of the discussion, are the cargo on that ship. Now you know you can't send a letter through the mails unless you pay for that cargo. You can't move it through there. You can't ask someone to do you a service and carry those mails nationally or internationally. And so up here, we'll put a, a stamp and pay for that thing. Keep the receipt. That's your, your bill of lading, and this is your evidence that you paid for that stamp. And usually... Like a duty. Like a duty. Yeah, this is the impost of duties this guarantees that it's going to be going through uh, international commerce and it's recognized as, as being legitimately carried by other nations by virtue of those treaties which are the supreme law of this land so the United States can't stop mail from moving through it unless there's something absolutely illegal going on with the mail itself <coughs> but you're, you cannot stop commerce if you slow the mail down, think about it. All you're doing is interfering with a contract. You're slowing it down by time. Uh, you're interfering with the interest which is growing on a particular uh, item, for instance, that you've purchased or money that you've lent, which is also based on time. And so you're, by delaying these things, you're costing the people who are on this contract money, either delay of payment or delay of delivery. So this guarantees the payment. Typically, it's, it's uh, going to be purchased in $1 increments. And so you can make that purchase. You then go ahead and sign or cancel this. The thing that's interesting, I'll just throw in here, on that $1, when you ask for a $1 postage stamp from the U.S. Postal Service, uh, Postal Service, you'll find that the S has two lines through it instead of one line. For one dollar postage stamp, it's a two line S, and what that is is lawful money. It's equal to money of exchange, if those of you have read the Modern Money Mechanics, it's a 52, 53 page document from the Federal Reserve. Um, they explain the difference of mon money of exchange on this, side, on this side and money of account. Money of account is all the debt notes, all the promises to pay. A note means promise to pay. So you see Federal Reserve note on the piece of green paper that you have in your pocket or your purse, that means a promise to pay. So everybody's promising everybody else to pay, nobody's paying, everybody's promising to pay. But over here you have gold, silver, and our exemption, our, our energy, our unlimited credit. 
And so whenever you, whenever you see that stamp, you've probably seen the fox head stamp, the $1 fox head stamp. It's got two lines. New Zeus. Yes, and now there's, there's a new one that's Zeus, I guess, or whatever, and it has two lines. And what that is is the same as silver. You're putting money of exchange on this side, and go ahead and explain what you're doing whenever you sign across the table. Uh, we discussed a little bit last week, or last time we were here, but uh, the cancellation of the stamp is your cancellation signature. And what I have found uh, useful is just to place through there with the autograph, and then you're going to use your real person cancellation. This makes you the postmaster of your vessel. And you've now given permission to cancel the stamp, utilize this that you've already purchased, you've already put the money into commerce through the government. That treaty now that you've entered into is, is the International Postal Union. And every country in the world that's a signatory to that now has the obligation to make sure that this vessel gets to where it's going safely. May I, may I throw in a point here? Um, usually what we'll do is we'll, we'll have the autograph um, like was mentioned on the first um, uh, video, um, spelled correctly across, and then put with the autograph underneath that autograph. And then above it, it might be advisable, uh, I'm not giving this advice, but uh, if people want to think about doing this, they can put without prejudice, which is what we have here. You can even add the word explicitly, making it very clear. But um, so, yeah, go ahead about the, the, you know, the worldwide postal union. So now they're, they're, doing. they're obligated through treaty, the postal union treaties, to make sure this gets where it's going. <clears throat> I had mentioned last week uh, also that uh, bankrupt countries can't declare war. Well, what happened in 1933, we came into a real major problem in the country here, and an even worse problem in 39 through 41. We were being pulled into World War II. Well, we really couldn't declare war. But when we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, the postmaster at Pearl, or in Hawaii, called the postmaster in Washington, D.C. and said, I can't get the mail through. We've been attacked, or the mail's being interfered with. Send the military escort. So the postmaster general of the United States gives an order to the president of the United States as a chief executive officer and commander in chief to mobilize the military to make sure that mail gets through. And so pretty much this is what's happened. What does a war do? It interferes with commerce. And the game is nothing interferes with commerce. And so probably what we're doing over in the Gulf right now, Britain has a problem. They get 60% of their oil out of Kuwait. And it's a little tiny province down of the south part of Iraq. Well, we've got a loose cannon floating around down there who <clears throat> occasionally will come across the border and interfere with Britain's <coughs> commerce. If you were to interfere just for a period of time with Britain's commerce, with Britain's oil, they are the largest investor in the United States in commodities and stocks. So think what happens there. With commodities and stocks interfered with in Britain, they begin to sell off and cash out their investments. Well, their investments are for a great part in the United States. If there was suddenly a sell-off of their investments in the United States, our economy, which at the time was on a knife edge, would have probably collapsed. So was it a war for oil? Yes and no. <clears throat> it was a war for British oil. The British oil was part of their commerce and their production and their investments, just keeping the, uh, the commerce alive. And so when that was taken out of circulation, it was putting our, our country at risk. So without going into too much more detail on, on uh, some of the ramifications of that, we'll get back to this situation. These are vessels in commerce. Think of another one. When the astronauts were standing on the moon, one of them said, oh golly, look at the Earth. It looks like a ship in a sea of space. Wonder what the Antichrist is going to be, the captain of that ship. This is going to be the master of the world's commerce, and they're moving toward it uh, pretty much uh, very quickly. And no, uh, no juggernaut. Joe's, Joe uses the word world. We hear the global word, we hear the world word, one world government. You don't hear one earth government, you hear one world government. 
and so that's what they're talking about. So well, I'm getting too scattered here, uh, going off in some some corners. But what we're working with is that these are all flag being the right. One. These are all these are all vessels, and we're dealing with vessels, <coughs> commerce. Uh, think of a, a sea of commerce. So think of these things as ships in commerce. Think of yourself as being in control of these things or being controlled by, by these pieces of paper, which are all, again, fiction. But unless this fiction <coughs> operates, commerce doesn't operate. Up here, you were gonna, we have got a... Something about a courtroom? Yeah, where, where the, yeah, where we're the gonna, captain of the vessel is up there and, and with the right-hand side. So on this side, everything on this side of the vessel <coughs> is, is the debtor side. But in flag law, typically the, the, uh, the courtesy is to place the flag either in the center, the flag that controls the vessel, either in the center of the room, for instance, or to the right side as it's facing the people here so that it's under your sword arm. This all has to do with English heraldry or international heraldry as it goes. The judge, who's going to be sitting up here, for instance, in a courtroom, <coughs> In his little robes is going to be facing this way. Everybody facing the judge on this side would be the debtor side. Okay. They're under his sword arm. This is the portion that disciplines the, the court. Over here is the creditor side, and he's obligated to defend the creditor. That's under his shield arm. And so this flag on this side is basically facing you, and this is what it's saying that that this takes precedence over everything on this ship. This is the law that governs the ship. So all the laws that are attendant to uh, the Republic of Texas, for instance, in this case, would be governing the laws of this contract. And anyone who wanted to enter onto that ship would be under that particular sovereignty. So if you enter a courtroom, <coughs> excuse me, the same thing happens. With uh, common law, common law operates on a single level. The people in the courtroom, the jury, uh, the defendant, plaintiff, and the judge. That's common law. No one is above anyone else. This is truly what the Constitution of the United States was addressing. This is what the Declaration of Independence was addressing. All men are created equal. No one's above anyone else. In the fiction situation, however, something came up. Up here sits the judge. We're looking sideways at the courtroom now. Here, he's got the prosecutor. Here we have a witness box, and here we have the jury box, and here we've got you, down here. <coughs> in there also is a flag in that courtroom, and typically because this is a little vessel in commerce here, as it were. You're out here on the poop deck. The judge is in control. He has summary judgment over everything in that courtroom. The prosecutor represents everything below him. He's an officer of the judge. He's kind of like the CEO or the executive officer on the ship. The witness is in a box. He doesn't exist. The jury is in a jury box. They don't exist. And you're down here as a defendant standing under understanding the charges and this is what happens now he can submit you to summary judgment and make you walk the plank in many cases all you're dealing with here is a type of military law and he can make you walk the plank or keel haul you or hang you or and maintain himself as uh, 
as innocent to anything that, that's done on board that ship. So we get back to the good old earth and see a space. Whoops, where's the high water mark? Uh, what kind of a flag are they under? What, what's operating here? You have to understand the risks you're taking when you in introduce yourself into commerce. In the world, not of the world. Well, how do you put your foot in one canoe and then put your other foot in another canoe and still keep yourself from being wishboned out there on the water? And this is pretty much what we're dealing with. It's a real balancing act. So uh, what we're, we're dealing with primarily is commerce, maritime rules, rules of the flag, rules of the document, and the document itself is going to be the valuable uh, study here because as we're learning, we're going to flag the document, we're going to send the document out with the stamp, we're going to cancel it out, take control of it as the postmaster because as you know, the postmaster actually, in terms of the treaty, is actually in control of the document because this is the guy that's going to keep this thing safe in international law. So really, he is the one who has ultimate power over here, this postmaster, or postmaster general of the ship. And if you sign through it, that's you. Your second situation is to take control of the document, and down in the bottom right, and I shouldn't have boxed it, but just to give you an idea of where this thing is going to exist. Down here, you're going to take control of this document on the front, and on the back right-hand side, everything on the right belongs to the creditor. This is the only guy that can talk. This is the only guy that's listened to. The debtor is silenced. When you go in and you think you're arguing pro se, pro se litigant is litigating as an attorney representing himself. You're not an attorney. If you walk in and tell the court you're pro se, They'll accept that as true, but they know it's not. They'll accept that it's true, they know it's not. You're committing a fraud on the court. You just lied to them. You deserve everything you're going to get. Another rule they use is fraud vitiates fraud. This is honor among thieves. If you can lie, we can lie. These are the new rules. The only rules that operate are the rules of the contract. You walk into the courtroom, there's the four corners. Actually, nothing's operating in that courtroom except the law of four cornering. It's all in fiction. You walk into the fiction world, you're under the control of the Red Queen. And when she says off with his head, we're off with her head, in the case of Alice, that's what's operating here. Joe, why the, why, why the Red Queen? Why are they using the word red? What do you think they're Well, doing? I think uh, they're using red as well. This word comes uh, from the word, uh, our English word, which comes from this Latin word, <clears throat> That's the genitive. When, when you work Latin, or if you study Latin, uh, that's the noun form, that's the genitive. Genitive means possessive. So the rubric is done by virtue of this ruby or rubare or rubris that was used to show the signature in blood that the person signing this had the blood authority blood authority, usually, uh, and again we're getting too far afield, but from the Messiah, from the Messiah's bloodline, if you read Bloodline of the Grail, you have to have authority to sign in red. And so whether it's the Pope or the King of England or whatever, they will typically sign in red, letting them know that they're, they have the authority of the bloodline from the beginning, and they have the authority of the blood itself, they're real living beings. And so when they sign in rubric, you're telling them that you have the authority and you're signing in blood, and so this takes the authority of the document. The Pope will sign typically in red. You're all familiar with a red letter Bible. Well, the Messiah speaks in truth, and when the Messiah speaks, they show it in red letters. It's the rubric, again. He has authority, and he is the bloodline. He has the power through the inheritance of the Father himself to speak with authority and he must be obeyed. Down the bottom here then you're going to do a your signature, real man's signature with the copy claim. Now everybody knows what a copyright is. Well having a right 
is like having a right arm. Nothing happens until you pick up a hammer and start building a wall with it. The copy claim is the action. You've copy claimed it. You must claim something. And think of claims in terms of the, the two prospectors heading for the, the county courthouse on back of their mules, racing for, that, racing for that county courthouse so that the first guy there to register the claim gets the gold claim. Number two is a secondary holder, has a secondary claim, and typically no claim at all. So once you're the first one in, first in time, first in line, first in time is the rule. First in time, first in line. The first around the post? Yep. This, this guy holds the, is the lien holder, basically. He's got the claim. What you get when you file that UCC is something presumptive. The UCC really doesn't say anything. It's a notice to the world. But it has no claims or real legal, legal power. But what it's going to have is first in time, first in line notice that somewhere there is a security agreement or a contract in place that makes you the primary lien holder. So when they see that out in the world, when they see that thing come up on a notice, that's notice literally to the world. The Uniform Commercial Code is set up by this organization, and that'll be down in the bottom of your UCC, for instance. Going to be the same situation here. We've got debtors and creditors, and this little IACA, it's down outside the box right here. And this is the organization. If you punch this up on your computer, Oh, yeah. If you punch this up on your computer, uh, this one says Office of Secretary of State. This is an old form. It'll say IACA down the bottom of it. So if you punch that up, you'll learn all there is to know about the IACA and what the UCC is all about. It says that this document is on record somewhere. It establishes a debtor and a creditor, and that these people are, from what it looks like to me anyway, this is the International County Recorder. It's a woman. She lives in Canada. They'll give you her home address and phone number and the rest of the staff that run this thing. It controls the registration of all of these documents of debtor creditors in all the English-speaking world, the United States, Canada, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and the territories. And so this is where your UCC goes and who it's available to when it's put out in commerce. And, of course, they're trying to draw everyone in to this single commercial notice situation, but this primarily notices everybody that you're the creditor and you've established a debtor over here by some form of contract. And these contracts are what we're, we're going to be talking about here. You're the first in time, you're the first in line, you have the copy claim on it, and this copy claim then is written on the bottom right hand side of that document. It could be something similar to this or uh, what I usually do is I put the word seal mm -hmm. just as any monarch would have uh, we are sovereign, we were born sovereign, any monarch has his signet ring or his seal ring and he, he seals. Well we can either put our our red thumb thumbprint or or we can put our initials down here in the bottom right. Remember, it has to be on the back side, bottom right as well. And that, that's the last thing in, on the document, on, on the back side. Well, I, I do it front and back. And then I put copy hyphen claim. So copy claim here is we are claiming this document. Front so, back of each page. Front and back of each page. Uh -huh. So that way, if it's, not, if it's blank on the back and they look at the back, the fiction looks at the back, no, nobody, nobody finished up this document. And they put the copy claim on the back. That's right? they stamp it too, right? They stamp it. And if you notice, if there's a notary stamp, where's that notary stamp? It's usually right here on the bottom right. They usually have enough room you where know, you, can, you can make sure that if you, if you type up the document that you have that notary seal high enough. So you can make sure, even if you have to, have to do it the smallest little whatever, you know, the smallest little red initials, you get that bottom right hand corner. Okay, because that means you've now claimed that document front and back, bottom right. Yeah. Front and back of every page or just the back of the last page of a document of say five, six pages? Okay, if you have uh, two, two of seven pages, three of seven pages, four of seven pages, 
then you can do you can do what you're saying. Just the last. Okay, just go and put it on the last. If if you want to put it on every page, that's fine too. Okay, uh, that way they can't squeeze something in there. Uh, but I don't know, you know, that, that they would even try to do that. But, but because we're making up this document, when we're taking the back. Uh, if Joe is not your signature, it's your autograph. Define the difference between signature and autograph, please. Yeah, the signature is simply uh, begins with the word sign, and a sign is simply simply that. It's an indicator. It's a fiction. The autograph is auto, comes from the self. It's the self signing. And so these words mean things, and uh, I'm going to break and let David continue. And uh, I'll come back on if, if you're not bored with it and teach you about the power of words and how these things are either constructed positively with the use of words or they're destroyed by the use of words. The scripture says, by your words are you justified, by your words are you condemned. How true. We're ensnared by the words of our mouth. And so we have to be very careful about words. They use words of art on paper. And so when they give you a form to sign, they're making a legal determination for you. Use our form. And so you've taken their instruction as, basically, they, you set them up as your power of attorney to instruct you as to how you're to fill out that form. And you've, subjugate, you've understood or you understand their instructions in that form. Anytime up. anybody hands you a form, they're, they're making a legal determination for you. This is why Scott wanted to go ahead and use his own. You want to go ahead and write it up your way. You're making your own legal determinations about what you're about to sign. Down at the bottom here, even, even under these new IACAs, uh, we put this underneath the IACA. And because this is going to reproduce when you fax it in black, if you write down here, sign in, or autographed in, however you want to do it, ready. The, the new national form, let's just say this particular form, the, the new national form will say IACA, we're in the place of the Office of the Secretary of State of Texas web form. If you notice, there's a little bit of space down here, and that's where we put it. Okay, and then if we turn it over on the back, we also do it in the back. Then when you, when you fax this thing in, and I recommend faxing because there is no way that this uniform commercial code is going to take uh, the mixed case lettering. It'll come in all capital letters throughout the whole thing so that they've got control over it as a fiction. But you can put in there DBA, we've done it. You can take the DBAs and you can make the uh, entity's name or the uh, debtor. Uh, for instance, Joe Blow, <coughs> DBA, D slash B slash A slash, as all capital letters, Joe Blow, uh, <coughs> Agent City of uh, Dallas. <coughs> Incorporated ink. When you send it in, turn it upside down through the fax machine. There's a lot of blank area down here. That portion usually disappears, and uh, this will come out on their fax. And when we get them back, and they've accepted them, they accept them exactly as we've sent them in, with the control of the document at the bottom. So now you're you've got primary control of the UCC because you made the filing. This has also become the bailment. You've given them your name, haven't you? They owe you some money, so you can make the IACA your debtor, which we've done. We just go ahead and put them on there as a debtor and put yourself in as creditor also. So anytime you give up that signature, you're giving up your credit. You're giving up something very valuable. Think of your signature always as a big pot of gold. The officer wants the signature. Here, give me your signature. Give me your receipt for a million dollars. Where does it say that? Well, if you look in your county records, you'll find my offer of contract. My offer of contract is if you take my signature, I take your million dollars. That's fair. Sign for it. Sign for it. Here, sign, sign for So we've got quite he's a few people. He's you to sign. You, you ask him to sign. Carry, little carrying little. Uh, receipt books with him. It's all business. This is not about, it's all commerce. Not about any. It's all about commerce. And we're staying in honor when we say, thank you for doing business with, with me. Thank you for pulling me over and accepting my offer of contract. I, I talked about this a little bit in the first video. Thank you. And here's your invoice. May I have my receipt, please? So he's giving you an invoice, and you say, oh, thank you for using my property. Here's your invoice. So if he gives you an invoice for, it's called a citation, it means the same thing, it means debt. 
and we have unalienable rights, we're, we're debt free. So he gives you, a, let's say that's a $200 ticket. You thank him. Now you attach your $1 million invoice for him. <coughs> <coughs> and you tell them, uh, here, here you go, or you can mail it in afterwards. You have three days to do this, 72 hours. And you just accept it for value and put a sticky pad on top saying, please adjust my account. Here's your $1 million for, for using it. So now who's the, who's the bigger debtor? And he's going to take that and adjust the account, not from the $1 million silver that you're giving him invoice, but his corporation will take that to, to the federal window at the Department of Treasury, and they'll actually get paid two hundred dollars because they have your energy, they have your exemption, your autograph. Okay, that's all they're looking for, and then they can monetize that in fractional banking ten times, and they, you know, they do a whole bunch of other things. So, uh, but what, what they can't do anything with is when you give them an invoice for one million dollars silver for a violation, or you count how many times that name is used. And so what happened to me with Fort Worth, as I mentioned, was I did this with the, with the police officer, and then I get a presentment from the court clerk. And then Rice tells me, this is three years ago or so, and he, you know, Rice tells me, oh, go ahead and thank her and send her the invoice. I say, can I do anybody else? Notice to the principal is notice to the agent. Notice to the agent is notice to the principal. Go to the top. So to the mayor, <coughs> to the city manager. And so they all got invoices, and they never heard anything more about it. So they're forever my debtor because it's 24 to 1 ratio uh, from Federal Reserve notes to silver. So you can figure that out, you know, it's about $7 million is what it came out to. Sorry, yeah, these sorry. are very interesting uh, as far as, as these contracts go. And as David said, I've got several invoices out in Abilene. Um, Much bigger. <laughs> considerably bigger. And, uh, Mayor uh, resigned with him. <laughs> and the city manager. How, how interesting it happens because once this... Once this is accepted, then you have a contract. And what you've got is you've got one corporation merging with another corporation, don't you? And that's a meeting of the minds, and that's a contract. There's no duress. Buyer who doesn't have to buy, meeting a seller that doesn't have to sell, coming together and agreeing on a price, which is the definition of fair market value of anything you're buying. Who's you've the established the fair market value. Who's the creditor? Who's the debtor? Now, suppose somebody uh, comes up and says... Uh, Here's a $4,000 tax bill on your $100,000 house. Where's the contract? Did I have a meeting of the minds? Where is your appraiser's license? Who said that property is worth $100,000? The state says that fair market value is a buyer that doesn't have to buy, meeting a seller that doesn't have to sell, and coming to an agreement of a price. Let's say the real estate market's a little slow, and they come in and say, your property is worth $100,000, and you say, thank you very much, I accept your contract. And close your check. The city just bought your house. <coughs> or that particular agent just bought your house. And, and then attach your invoice for them using your property. Which is how your interesting, property. how inconsistent they are when they send you a tax appraisal. Well, what's an appraisal? An appraisal opinion. is an opinion. Everybody's got one. Everybody's got one. And on the back of all of these, the, uh, the MAI is like the PhD of appraisers. Let's call a member of the Appraisal Institute. The MAIs are the most expensive appraisals you get. <coughs> these guys are super good. But on the back, there's their disclaimer. This is only an opinion based upon. They have three different approaches that they take. And one is a market approach. What are other things selling for? Uh, they have a replacement approach. What's it going to cost if this thing burns down? And what do we got to pay to re replace this thing? Uh, basically, it's a cost approach. Uh, there's a third one, slips my mind momentarily. But basically, all of these are different. And he kind of averages them out and he gives his opinion. They, they use it, they call it highest and best use. Highest and best. So, the point I'm making here is, is none of these are the same. 
what is he, what's he going to weight? Is he going to weight it toward the market approach? Depending on what you want to do with it. Uh, do you want to replace the building? Do you want it for insurance? Or do you want to sell it? Do you want it for insurance appraisal here? Uh, if it burns down, what's it going to cost me to replace this thing? And basically the highest and best use, or I'm going to build something on this thing. Well, what can I build that's going to uh, make the, the price of this reach its ultimate peak? So he'll average these things out depending on what you want to use them for. The banks typically use them. That's what the bank wants. Actually, when an appraiser gives an appraisal, he's really working for the bank. The bank wants to make sure that the money that they're lending is justified. Otherwise, they get into really big problems. Bankers go to jail all the time for lending money and then taking a little extra under the table. The MAI or the appraiser will jack that thing up a little bit. It's an interesting story that uh, an MAI had told, and I think it's worth repeating. We got a guy down in Abilene. Everybody kind of knows him. He had as much uh, print news on him as John Kennedy did from 60 to 63. A um, guy by the name of Billy Saul Estes. And Billy had an interesting thing he used to do. He would finance fertilizer tanks that he had spread out over property. And so you take the banker out and you say, well, I want to borrow $10 million. And so well, what do you got for collateral? So well, I got these fertilizer tanks. So he'd drive them from fertilizer tank to fertilizer tank. Um, and he would impress the banker that those fertilizer tanks were there. And, the bank would go ahead and underwrite that. Well, actually, there was one fertilizer tank. And he would get a little guy over here hiding in the bushes. And he would have a sign. And Billy would drive the banker up to the tank. And the guy would note it on his inventory book. And they would go out humping and bumping in their little pickup truck. And he'd drive them back in from the other direction. And they'd go to the next fertilizer tank, which was the same one. <laughs> this guy would run out and change the sign. And he kept doing that. Anyway, he got caught. And what did he what was he doing? He was financing an equity that didn't exist. Okay? What is the equity? Equity is this is market value of the property. And this thing down here is the lien portion of it or mortgage down here. The increase in market value here is known as an equity. You buy for $100,000, um, excuse me, you buy for 100000 and this thing goes to 150000 When you sell, you get the difference. You get the 50000 That's the market value. So this is the equity. This is basically what Billy was financing here. This is the portion, and I'll finish this up because it's going to be very valuable uh, understanding what's known as title. And then we'll give it back to David and go on with this. This portion down here is the portion that you don't own. Typically it's the bank or somebody who finances for you. The market value here is this value that's gone up by market pressures. The question was, Everybody kind of laughed when they heard about financing this equity that didn't exist, obviously. He put the question out to the Board of Realtors, and that was, uh, how many of you have financed an equity that didn't exist on your real estate property? Now, how does that happen? They will get an appraiser who is somewhat unscrupulous, and this is why the MAIs don't like these competitive appraisers, because you can find one and if you shop enough of them, they'll come up with an opinion that will allow you to take that $100,000 and he might say, eh, I think that property's worth $125,000. Now what can you do? You can finance another $25,000 pocket money there out of the bank, which gives you a lot of playroom here if you're running a commercial property. So there wasn't a sound in the room when he said that because typically that's what will happen. Real estate agents will go out and shop appraisers to get a better deal, to get more money for their client, to get the listing. The insurance companies, of course, get more uh, 
more premium money for it, and the bankers are going to make more money because they're making more interest with it. And inflation works on behalf of the system in that situation. It ha works on behalf of, this, of the, the, uh, the fiction. In truth, inflation is terrible because it puts claims on property that don't exist. It literally is air. You're financing air. You're financing the property, and then somebody up there says, well, the air above that property is worth about another $25,000. Literally inflates the contract. So what we're doing here then is, is we're working with titling, and this is the next thing you need to understand. The title or ownership to a property. And everybody wonders why they don't own their car, why they don't own their, their property. The state says all property resides in the state for the good of the state since 1933. They've seized all your property. When you ran out of gold and silver, what else is going to back the money of the United States? What else is going to back that currency? Those IOUs. Everything on deposit in the banks that you've placed in there. So most of that is real estate. The two biggest investments people make are their cars and their houses. So that's what goes in here. Well, here's what happens. There are four of these issues under title that are time, use, possession, and this is what you've got. This is like the king owns the car, but he's allowing you the time and the use and the possession of the car. He let you play with it. But on the international market, when he's got to go out and sign a treaty, a commercial treaty, he's got to have over here primary interest. That's the thing that makes the money. This is where the power is. This is where the title vests. So the title down at the state, this is one that you send down to Austin, this is your uh, manufacturer's certificate of origin on the car, the MCO. That goes down there. And this gives them primary interest in the vehicle. They give you a certificate of title up here, which is, anytime you see that word certificate, it's a debt instrument. Debt instrument. You owe money on this. So they can tax this. They don't tax this. This is true ownership. This portion uh, indicates the person who, or, or the individual or power that actually owns this thing. So title has to do with these four issues here. These are yours. That's the big one. When you set up that security interest, this is what you're dealing with. You've given all of your interest, the interest of your debtor, over to your real person. The interest of the debtor Joe, excuse me, when you said MCO, did you mean MSO? Yeah, they call it Statement or Certificate of Origin, yeah. Well, Certificate, since you said it being yeah. a debt instrument. Yeah, I think the, the state calls them MCOs, yeah, because they're, they're a debt I think instrument. The manufacturer yeah. calls them manu Manufacturer Statement of Origin. S SOs? Yeah, yeah. So. either one. But the so changes to MCO. What, we're, what, what happens here then is that you are going to take. this little deal here, whatever the property is that you have that you're giving over, including your signatures and your photographs and your fingerprints and everything basically that you own. You're going to take this. No, Joe, we have seven minutes. Okay, seven minutes. With it. Okay. Uh, we're going to take this and we're going to take it from here on the debtor side, which is on your security agreement, and we're going to put it over to the creditor, which is you. That's the right side. That's on the right side of all document. these documents here. This is going to go over here. And this is the security agreement. This is the thing that really gives you the power, not the UCC. The UCC only says that this thing exists. And this is the first in time, first in line. You want to be the first one there with the security agreement register or recorded first in time because this gives you the control of it. 
So you're first in time on the security agreement. You've registered it. You've now set it up on the UCC so that the world knows that thing exists. And now they're without excuse if they want to deal with this debtor. Because no matter what they bring against the debtor to make a collection from him, that security agreement is going to have a $100 billion debt on it that he owes to the creditor. And think of it as a big bucket, big sack. And until that money fills up that bucket, until, That's silver. Yeah. until that debtor fills that bucket, no other creditor can come in and put a lien on that debtor. If he does, he knows he's going to be second in line until that bucket is filled. So until you get your $100 billion from that debtor, he can't make his first penny. So a quick example, you're taken into court. They're after the straw man debtor. There's a $200 fine. This guy goes over to the court and says, give me the order of the court and pay me. Here's my security agreement. Here's my UCC. You owe me. He owes me first. I've got, I've got the first claim on this. I don't know if anybody's tried it yet, but I think it's worth trying because this is exactly what happens. And you've now got it registered, or recorded, I should say, not registered. You've got it placed over here with your creditor. You're, hold, you're a holder in due course, and you're the creditor of this debtor forever for the $100 billion. And just a side note, make sure that when you, when you have your security agreement, make sure that there's an indemnification clause in that security agreement, that the straw man, corporate fiction, is indemnifying you, the living soul, from all liens and levies. He's taking all liability. That corporate fiction name, that statutory person, corporate fiction, is taking all liability in the sea of commerce. He's Everything. first in line for execution. Yes, he's first in line. Okay. <coughs> so that indemnity clause, see there were security agreements being used in years past. They got in trouble because that indemnity clause didn't exist. Didn't exist. So the indemnity clause now is like an insurance policy guaranteeing that that creditor is going to be protected under all circumstances. He's held out liable. So even the statutes of the state of Texas says an individual can't be arrested for the actions of the corporation or legal fiction over here. That's actually written out in the statutes. So real, real quick before we run out of tape here, uh, just to get some basics of the document. Um, You've seen here, I've written over here. Instead of, you know, whenever you, you address a letter to someone, you always put your, your name and everything on the left-hand side. Change. Put it on the right. The right side is the creditor side. What would we have, one minute, two minutes? Okay. We've got two minutes. And then we address whoever we're addressing. I don't care if it's the president of the big federal corporation, United States of America. He's the debtor on this side. I don't care if it's the secretary of the treasury that claims to be on the creditor side, he's the debtor. Why? We are the creators of this whole creation. We are the living souls. Yes? And if you ever get a presentment from like the court or something... That it's on the right? You no, know, they list you in the middle, that means it's undecided. That's right. And they're waiting for you to make... To make the determination. To, to yeah. determine which way to go with it. Like I said in the first video, who's, which is greater, the creator or the creation? Mm -hmm. Which is greater? Creator. The creator. Okay, we the people, the living souls, the flesh and blood, men and women on the earth, have created all these corporations, they're corporate fictions. And all the agents for them are operating in their fictional capacity. So they also, in the system, in this big box, are fictions. Remember the movie The Matrix, okay? So it's all perception. So if we say that they're live, that they're real, because we hear them and see them with our, 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 our physical body's eyes, we can't be moved by that. They are acting in their fictional capacity. You're the only one in the courtroom that is alive. I went into one courtroom and stood before the king's bench. It's a, it's a bank. Courtroom is really the crown's court, okay? And you stand before the, and the bailiff put me in a taped off box on the floor with tape. It was a box and said, stand in the box. I stood in the box. I don't care if I'm standing in the box. The whole thing is a box. But I'm the only living flesh and blood man in there. So anyways, going back to the document creation, so we have, we address, whoever we address as debtors on this side. If they ever put theirs over here, 
seconds. Thirty seconds. We ever put those over here, then we just we, we just had to, you know write it back and do a correction. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pick up again. This is the first hour of this second taping, um, and then we're going to pick up by changing the tapes and then going. Into, if anybody wants to take a break, this is the time to do it. Uh, we've had our break, and, and we're going to continue with the structure of a document. We'll bring up. Uh, uh, I've written this here. How we structure a document is they will always put our name, our fiction name, on this side, the left side, meaning. They're trying to say we're the debtor. We always structure our document with the right-hand side, the creditors on the right-hand side, and whenever I give my address, we are not domiciled, we are not domestic. So I put care of non-domestic, the street name. A lot of times it's best to actually spell out the, even the word street and not have an abbreviation, okay? And the city name, spell it out, and don't put the abbreviated capital letters for the state. That's the federal zone. That means you're a fiction. So we don't use that. We spell the name of the state out <coughs> completely, upper lower case. Okay, proper English grammar. And then below, the domestic mail manual. That's, it's not very clear. It's DMM. The domestic mail manual 122.32 says that zip code we don't have to have a zip code. Yes, go ahead. Is that not code rules, regulations? Yes, it is. Okay, why use it? Good question. <clears throat> okay, if we're actually if we're actually um, talking with the fiction, we are talking with a fictional system here. All right, the fictional system really they're fictions. They don't exist, so we can't pull them over on the common law side. And now there's different perspectives of this. Of course, different people will have their quote unquote opinions. But when I go to France, if I demand that the French people speak my language and they go, no English, or I mean, I'm sorry, that's Spanish, you know, <laughs> no English. If I go to uh, Spain and, and, they, and they say, no English, Espanol, habla Espanol? Sorry, I don't speak Span uh, Spanish. I'm an American, I, you've got to speak my, no. If we're going into a venue in the sea of commerce, which is all fictional, we better let them be able to understand what we're saying by using some type of thing. We're not saying here that we are, what we're saying is we are exempt. The word exempt is outside. We're saying we are not part of this zip code system. We are non-domestic. We are exempt. And when we put this here, we're not saying we're underneath this. We're just saying, we, if you want to put the word your, put the word your or something to indicate that it's not yours. But, you know, keep in mind, you're claiming this whole thing. Keep in mind, you have explicitly without prejudice up here, nothing you, you say can and will be used against you. If you don't reserve all your rights with these words here, without prejudice, what you say can and will be used against you. But when we do this, and I'll, this is why I, I put explicitly without prejudice up here. And I've covered that on my, on my first video. Uh, our first video, I should, I'm almost correcting myself here. So anyways, but if you don't feel comfortable with using DMM 122.32, don't put it in. You know, if you don't feel comfortable with doing that, that's fine. If the, you get to the post office and here's the outside of your envelope and they say, we have to have that zip code. Okay, put the zip code in brackets. That's what I do. Why? I don't want to get into to dispute, controversy, and conflict with the system. A sovereign stays in honor, always. So what do we do? Conditional acceptance. Conditional acceptance, we put it in brackets. What does bracket mean? It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist, basically. It's not legal. Here's the parentheses. Uh, Joe mentioned, what is that, Joe? The, the, the rounded corners of the parentheses. If this were rounded here, it would be parentheses. But because it's not rounded, it's square, that means it's a box. It does not exist. But parentheses is really for emphasis. Is that correct? Right? You're, you're making something really stand out when you put it into parentheses. But this, that's not parentheses. That's a bracket. It means it's not legal. <coughs> it's not legal. So if you want to have something in there that you, you, you're telling them this is not even legal in your system, Put it in brackets. It's just 
the, it's their language. It's the grammatical rules of their language. We speak English, they speak English, but their English is different than our English in many words, as we, as we covered on the, on the very first one. So, okay, I'm trying to get through this document here, and um, when we title something, you notice here, I don't know if you can read this, it says, Declaration in the Nature of an Affidavit. Why don't we say affidavit alone? Sovereigns declare. Sovereigns declare. Why do we put it in the nature of an affidavit? So that the fictions can understand it. All right? So we're putting it in a form of their language, our language, that they can understand. When you, when you have a policy enforcer, a code enforcer, or a police officer, policy enforcer, and he does an affidavit and gets this fictional character called the notary public to stamp it, the court clerk to stamp it, that's a statutory person, corporate fiction agent, operating in the fictional capacity, making a statement of truth. But it doesn't exist. Affidavit is fiction. So we are making a declaration, a living soul, a sovereign, makes a declaration. So we put declaration in the nature of an affidavit to title whatever we're doing, if it's an affidavit, if it's a notice, we can do, uh, you know, put notice here or whatever, notice in demand, or whatever we want to put here. And then what I always suggest for people to do is put without prejudice or uh, explicitly without prejudice. And I've covered that on the first one the Anderson's uh, commentary on the, on the Uniform Commercial Code and what this means in the first section. That the writers, the, the ones who codified the, merchant, the, the, the law of merchants, what they were putting in the very first section for themselves to protect themselves. And if you don't understand what's happening in the sea of commerce, uh, what you go back and see the very first one. So this is gonna be a three volume set and then there'll be more volumes coming. All right, so we put the address of the debtor over here Name, name is a noun, noun is a thing. All right? And I went over, I am not the name. I go by the name. All right? This came from, I'll just review here. It can be capital B or lowercase letter B, it doesn't matter. This came from a senior banker telling, a one, telling one that goes by, by the name Don that I know of, who's a friend of the one that goes by the name Rice that I know of also, a senior banker 25 years ago told him, Don, never, ever sign anything without by calling. Now you go in to sign a mortgage document, title papers, that title attorney, he's gonna say, no, you will not put that word there. Why, what is that saying? I've seen it with my own eyes, I've witnessed this. A guy that started bragging about what he was doing to the title attorney, and I just like shook my head, I couldn't believe he was doing that. And uh, the title attorney said, well, I'm not sending, I'm not going to waste my time to fax this because the mortgage company is just going to send it back if it has bicolon. You're going to have to take that bicolon out, correct it. He had to put his initials on the few times that he did it, on a few pages, and then he went on and signed it as surety, as surety for the corporate fiction, saying he was basically one and the same to his unrighteousness. So that's why I always say, I, and I've learned this from Joe, I've learned this from other people, this buy here from the Don, sharing it from someone he learned it from two, 25 years ago, and we're sharing this, <coughs> we're sharing it on. We're just sharing on. That's why when we're, I go by me, addressee, I go by you, at, you know, depending on who the addressor is. If he's saying you to me, the address, then you is, is the addressee, because he's addressing you, okay? So we talk about language and we talk about mastering of the language and I think something really funny I'll just throw in here is if someone says what's your name and whoever the someone is, if it's a fiction or if it's a living soul, you can, you can say no, what is not my name? What's your name? No, what is not my name? <laughs> Alright, so we, we, we can laugh about this and it goes back to who's on, who's on second, who, you, know, you know, what's on third or whatever, you know, we go back to that type of thing. So, but it really is true that I, we are not the name and of any, you know, I, I went over this, and I'll just review it. Even if it's upper lowercase, even if I sign in red ink here, I sign in red ink down at the bottom here by colon, okay, and I put autograph, you know, under here, and, um, uh, you know, I put, you know, some other things. If I sign here, 
and I put the words red, signed in red ink under here to let them know if it's photo photocopied that it's signed in red ink. All right, rubric is like what Joe was saying in the first part. It's the autograph, so we put the word autograph here. Or some, sometimes people like to put authorized autograph. Okay, and we have this here. Now, I put a hyphen in between my two given names, making it a proper noun, as per the style manual of the, the form manual of the uh, United States. So they're understanding what we're saying here. And then I put colon. Sometimes one can do clan or family of, but even if you don't put that, the colon actually differentiates the family name. So the family name here is not my name. And I'll put C with a circle around it if it's copyrighted, and I have for copyright on that. And then many times I will put under reserve or without prejudice, I explained that in the very first one. Um, so we put that just in small words above. All right, I ask the question, is that me? Now people have argued with me, that is you. I say, no, that's not me, that's ink. That's ink on a piece of paper, that's not me. If that's me, talk to it, see if it'll answer. It sounds silly, go ahead. <laughs> talk to the hand. <laughs> so talk to this and see if it'll answer. If it won't answer, then that's not me. Who is the living soul? Who is the spirit that has a soul, a mind and a will and emotions, lives in this earth suit, this body? I go by me, okay? So, or I go by you, or I go by, right? Okay, so what is this? This is a one given appellation. And look, look, it up, the, look up the word in the, in the law dictionaries for yourself. One given, why do I say one given? Because the two becomes one with a hyphen. It becomes one proper noun. Well, I'm not a noun. I'm not a name. I'm not even an appellation. I'm just signifying that this is an identifying title that differentiates one me with the other six billion me's in the world. It differentiates this me from another me that has the same name. There might be more than one John Bill Smith out there in the world. So now what they do is they'll put a number to indicate which is which, is which okay? Because if there's two of them, if there's two um, living souls that go by Jim James Jones, uh, they want to know which one is Jim James Jones, this number or this number, Social all right? Number. Yeah, Social Security number or uh, some other identifying number that they might put on there. Okay, so any questions? You had, Reggie, you had a question. What was the question? I was referring to Rice's uh, material. Should I uh, start addressing the top right of the documents with my name from now on? And then the people are on, you know, sitting in the document too. If someone here is 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 using a process done by one that goes by a certain name, in this case, Rice, excellent. I've learned tons from the man. He's been a mentor, and and but that doesn't mean that uh, I agree with everything he says or he agrees with everything I say. So if one is using that, go and go and talk with that with, with that living soul and see what that living soul thinks. And then determine for yourself. Don't think my thoughts. Think your own thoughts. Okay, this is what this is all about, is getting people to think their own thoughts. This is just a guideline. But you have to determine for your own life what you're gonna think and what you're gonna believe. And don't let someone else do your thinking for you. If they're standing in a pulpit, or if they're, standing, if they're sitting in a, in a king's bench somewhere called a judge's uh, bench or whatever, don't let them do your thinking for you. You think for yourself. You only have one life to live. Why let someone else that do all your thinking for you? Think for yourself, okay? And you may change your thinking. I've changed a lot of my thinking through the years. Uh, any more questions? There was another question. Um, okay, uh, let's call up. Walt, do you have down on, the, we're, we're autographing, on the creditor side down at the bottom. We put the copy hyphen claim at the bottom right here with our seal, whatever the seal is, whether it's a thumbprint where there's a signet, ring, seal, whatever your seal is, I put my initials, all right? It could even just be a squiggle mark. It could be an X. That's your seal, fine, you put the word seal above it. 
capital S, lowercase e, a, l. All right? Turn it over and put the same thing on the bottom. If you want to put your full autograph at the bottom, fine. There's room to do that. One thing I like to add, maybe I didn't know mine, but, or basically when I do a signature on something, to say this per FM 2710. Yes. So you, when you, so we're going to refer again, like we were sharing with you, if it speaks truth to your heart, keep it. If it doesn't speak truth to your heart, take it and put it on the shelf and chew on it. If later on it still doesn't speak truth to your heart, take it and throw it out. Use what speaks truth to you and test whatever you want to test about this fictional system, the fictional system of this world, of this world that we live in but not of. So it's all about language. It's do your own study. Get your own Black Saw dictionaries. Get your own uh, Bouvier's or go, go and check all this out, all right? Go to the Civil Law Library, like I mentioned before, and go and check out Anderson's commentary on Uniform Commercial Code. It's what the system, the BAR, the British Accredited Regency agents, they refer to in terms of to see what is, what is the commentary on this particular Uniform Commercial Code, all right? Which the Supreme Court of the Federal Corporation has ruled that that is the supreme law of the land and, but then you go to UCC 1-103.6 and see what Anderson says about that. There is something that's a higher law of the land. Pre-code law. What is pre-code law? You determine for yourself. I believe it's common law. I believe it's the golden rule. Treating others the way that you would want to be treated. All right? So, okay, so you can put the date over here. Sometimes I'll put... I'll put without prejudice over here on the left hand side or on the right hand side because when you put it over here, when you put it in the center, that's fine, that's neutral. You can put it over here if you want, but then that's saying that the creditor is operating. But remember what I said, the creditor and the debtor is all fiction. So when we sign in red ink, we're saying we're outside of this whole fic fictional world matrix. We're the creators of the whole world matrix, debtor and creditor, good and evil. Liability, I mean asset and liability. That's all what it's about. And what is what is going on when we have a system? When we have a system that's got two sides. What's going on between evil and good? Good and evil, creditor and debtor. What's going on? Five. Commerce, dispute, controversy, conflict. All right. But over here, the creditor. is playing the game of staying in honor. Okay? Over here, they look at this as always in dishonor. Why do we accept things for value? Because we are even outside this, and a sovereign never gets into dispute, controversy, and conflict. It doesn't matter what the accuser is saying. We accept it for value. What does that mean? Thank you very much. I own that. Now I can redraft it and send it back to you and say, by the way, by the way, by the way, all right? It doesn't matter what the fiction's saying, you know, they can say anything in here. Don't get into dispute, controversy, and conflict and defend yourself. If you defend yourself, what do you do? You make yourself the defendant, the defendant is always the debtor, all right? And it's always in dishonor. So you see the movies, um, Last Samurai, talking about honor. You see the movies like... Um, Go ahead and give me some names of some movies. You see it out there all the time. Huh? Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings or Braveheart, Braveheart etc. They're talking about honor and dishonor. They're talking about good and evil. That's the whole world system. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But it doesn't bring life. The only thing that brings life is to live as a sovereign outside and you can interact with your corporate fiction. Plug in if you want to, but realize that you, your body doesn't go into the fiction world of non-existence. The body is flesh and blood. Life is in the blood. And so we are always, always going to be the creators of this whole system. So we stay in honor all the time. All right. So um, now, okay, um, let, let's bring up. If, if you put stamps on the document, you put their stamps upside down, does that, does that tell them that they are in distress? Does, um, country under sea. Yeah, the, the upside down flag is just a uh, international symbol of distress. Well, I mean, the stamps though, of the document. If you could just address that real quick, and then we'll that, I, that, that I, I, I don't have any knowledge of. Put them on upside down. 
I don't know. The girlfriends used to send them. That means that means I love you. I don't know. <laughs> the slightest idea. There's a movie with Robert Redford. Uh, he was a general in the military that um, he was incarcerated, and I forgot the what the name of the, the last movie castle. was. Huh? The last castle. The last castle. That talks about the flag being upside down. Uh, it's a sign of distress. Oops. And then just rotated one time with martial law. So if you come just real quick, we okay. can, we can have, have Walter. Very quickly, uh, if you get to the library, pull up a, uh, a book on the history of flags. Anybody know what that is? I hope I've drawn it fairly well. Dutch East India Company. <clears throat> when the Netherlands, Germany, England, what have you, were plying the seas in commerce, conquering colonies and what have you, the Dutch East India Company is a company. Usually it was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, which would be the Lord of the, of the uh, Treasury of the particular company or country would get together and they would set up corporations to go out into commerce to bring back the wealth of the world either by trade or by war or uh, taking over colonies or establishing colonies or uh, just by pillage. Bring back the wealth to the country that set up the corporation. So it didn't bring a direct effect back to the back to the uh, the sovereign. <clears throat> when they established a colony that they financed, they put that colony in the upper left hand side of the flag. This already getting worrisome to you? Yep. If you go into flag law and the history of flags, you'll find that Dutch East India banner with different uh, portions quartered off here in the upper left signifying different countries. There'll be eagles and there'll be various animals involved in there. There'll be elephants and camels and what have you. But the Dutch East India Company was the original corporation. And the rule is corporations have something only the tree of life should be giving you and once you establish this thing, and this is actually working in your favor, corporations have immortality. Once they establish that thing, you're not dead. So once they create your name as a straw man, you're not dead. That's why they're going to come back after you're dead and go after your estate, your probate, whatever, and they continue to claim that name. So if corporations have immortality, then the Dutch East India Company is still immortally in control, they'd be basically the creditor. And what goes in the top left-hand side? Did it happen? 70-year mortgage. What happened in... Uh, That's 18. What happened here? The North tried to repossess the South, and the South tried to repossess the North on behalf of the creditors. That's, that was at the end of the 70-year bankruptcy, international bankruptcy. Yep. Then... I didn't take control of the bank. What happened there? Depression. They came in to get the money again. Well, they didn't, we didn't have any. So they pulled in what we did have, didn't they? They got the gold and the silver. And because that wasn't enough. What were we paying for here? The 1917 Emergency War Powers Act got us into World War I. That was the Federal Reserve Income Tax Act. The Federal Reserve and Income Tax had to go together because the Federal Reserve allowed us to borrow money from the World Bank, ERS, Dutch East India, the Netherlands, 
Queen Juliana, Queen Beatrice of the Netherlands. They are in partnership with a guy by the name of Rothschild, and they own And there's something that has to do with the number eight. And if you'll take a look at their symbol out on a gas station, you'll see a shell, which means they're at the base of the, at least to me, this is what it symbolizes. They're at the base or the bottom of the Sea of Commerce, aren't they? And they've got eight arms on them here. This eight is very significant. We'll talk about it later if we have time at the end of the film. <coughs> Mercy War Powers Act started World War II, started Korea, started uh, War on Poverty, started the War on Drugs, and if you'll look into the Senate documentation that ended even the Vietnam War, it says the 19, the first paragraph, the 1917 Emergency War Powers Act still being in effect, martial law. So what is happening here? All we keep doing is the president keeps just declaring war. There's never been a cessation to the war since 1917. Keep commerce. And so it continues on. There's never been an end to the war. There's only been a war. So it's, well, Congress has a power to declare war. Well, it did in 1917, and that's the end of it because bankrupt countries cannot declare war. Can't find an end to the war. So what happens? Well, anybody remember what happened there? It, it always happens October, November. Why? Because that's the that's the uh, that's the end of the fiscal. October, November. It always rolls over. The crash in twenty nine October, wasn't it? In October, November, nineteen ninety nine. Suddenly, Bill Clinton said, "Well, looky here. We've got five trillion dollars. We never knew we had." Well, where was that hiding? Office of Management and Budget? Treasury? Government Accounting Office? Where did they lose it? Five trillion dollars. We came out of bankruptcy. And they changed the dollars, if you'll notice. Clinton took credit for that, too, didn't he? <laughs> you'll notice that, oops, excuse me. The front of the document, the front of your dollar bills, is what color? Oh, pull one out. Come on. How, how many times have you people looked at a dollar bill? Come on. Pull one out. I gave you a big hint. Why? It's dead. It's a corporation. What's on the back of it? It's back with life, isn't it? That's why it's called a greenback, because it's black on the front. It's dead on the front, green on the back. Right? Sure. What's on the right hand side, guys? Green seal. Department of the Treasury. That's the creditor side. Do you know that seal used to be red under Kennedy and under Lincoln? That's probably why they were executed. They didn't bond them to the international bankers. They figured they could print useless money just as easily as anybody else. What's on the left hand side? Black the black. Sorry. What's over here? What's what does this say on the bottom left of that dollar bill? The Treasurer of the United States. The United States is bankrupt. Bankrupt. It's the debtor. It's over on the left hand side, isn't it? Whenever you see your your Internal Revenue Service documents that come and it says Department of the Treasury, notice it doesn't put U.S. It just says Department of the Treasury. What's it say over on the right hand side? Secretary of the Treasury. Who's Treasury? It doesn't say U.S. Where the, where's the Treasury? It's the Who crown. owns the key? It's the Who crown. owns the key to the to the lockbox? Who owns the key to the kingdom? Think about that. There's a little chevron in the middle of a circle there on a shield. That chevron is the same as a, uh, you know, without getting too, uh, I don't want to embarrass the ladies here, but uh, yeah, this is not, it's this a, not, you know, we're all male and female gender here on this, lip, this earth. So. There, there, that's who's running it. It's a phallic symbol. That's a male symbol. The chevron facing the other direction is the female. Anybody recognize that? No. Nice. Yeah. Look at the Sonic symbol on the Sonic restaurant. It's like that too. So what they've done is they're using that symbol there. And look at the Target symbol. It's red with a dot in the middle. That's a female symbol. 
It's, it's a square and a compass, and it's really the symbol of the male god who happens to be Zeus or Mercury. And this is the compasses by which he describes the earth or develops the architecture for the earth. And so this is what we're dealing with here. Uh, I'll talk to you more about this later at some, some time so in future. Going, but going back to the flag, uh, when the flag, according to what I've learned, uh, and you can check this out and research it for yourself, when the flag is flying, you see sometimes you see the what we call the American flag and people are hanging it off of a building and it's hanging straight up and down, vertical. That's the peace position. All right. Now what I was asking you, the former military man here, is what does it mean whenever it flies horizontal? Well, this, this is the symbol, at least we've been told, this is suspension of the Constitution. And you see that in many cases uh, where it's flying in this direction, even in the uh, Congress buildings, we're running this, this direction. Thank you. I, I didn't know that. Uh, that the Constitution has been suspended. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but just think about it when you see it being flown. Is the Constitution really being upheld as the basics of that the meeting that they're holding? Over here, you fly this obviously in this direction. It's the, <clears throat> the symbol of the claim. So you've got this thing flying somewhere on some property. What's it attached to? A stake. What do you do? You stake a claim, don't you? So they're claiming whatever is under that flag. Whatever you put on top of that flag claims the flag. So if you put a Coca-Cola can up there, well, guess what? But usually there's an eagle up there, and it's usually in gold, and so that eagle takes control over the flag. You know, they, they brag about the one nation under God. Who knows what the highest point in the capital is of the United States? The tip of the Washington Monument? No. Top of the Capitol building. Who sits on top of the Capitol building? There's a god up there. It's a goddess or something. Mer Athena, Mercury. Is that, is that Mercury? Is that Mercury? Getting close. Or Athena. Yeah. Columbia, the Dallas. Yeah. Any other guesses? All the same. Her. Per Persephone. Persephone. Hey, that name was in The Matrix. And remember the movie The Matrix? That was the Merovingian's girlfriend. Ah, that was her. That was her name. <clears throat> She's wearing the eagle feathers of her father, of Jupiter. Who's the eagle? Jupiter. Jupiter. Who is the? Who's the owl? Mercury. Mercury. She's the goddess of wisdom. That's why it's a wise old owl. And these things go on and on and on, but they have a totem in in the. Uh, in the histories of these particular crafts, and this is what they deal with. And these typically are come from the mystery religions. And then I'll get out of my way soon. And, and then, then they say once again what the ego stands for. It's Jupiter. Jupiter. Yeah. This comes from a Greek word. Nazi Germany also had that ego, did it not? Mm -hmm. Or was double, that a phoenix? Double. Was that a phoenix or ego? That wasn't a phoenix. That was double. Oh, that was double. Okay. Mystery Babylon, the Greek. What's mystery come from? Mysterion, the Greek, which means to whisper. What are they whispering? The name of the God. That's why God doesn't have a name in this country. We're a nation under God, as you perceive Him. So they made you the creator of God. God as you perceive Him, not as He perceives you. By the, word, by the way, go into your Old Testament scriptures in the KJV, the King James Version, Authorized Version, and look up whisper and see what the scriptures are saying about the word whisper. So what is whispered it was when you became part of the, the group. They're pretty, uh, they're pretty uh, open about this. It's Lincoln Memorial. If you go over there, they'll tell you they're very proud of it. They say it was built on the floor plan of the temple of, I think, of uh, Diana, Diana. They're in Athens, right? Ephesus. And the Dianic, oh, right. the Orphic mysteries were part of the mystery religion. But what happened in those, in those temples? Well, you were told secrets. 
What are part of those secrets? Well, meanings of words. The, the God, the name of the God was whispered to you. So this doctrine, and then I'll get out of everybody's way here. <clears throat> and I'll close it out later if we have time on the meanings of words and why and how these crafts have changed the words to deceive you because without the deception, the fiction can't exist. And once the fiction doesn't exist in the truth, and we exist in the truth, which is the noun, the present. Once this thing exists, once this thing exists, this all this goes away. So this is what has happened here. And what is whispered is, Diana used to be baptized in the nude this time of the year uh, at Estra time. Oh, there's an interesting That's little... Easter. There's a, an anomaly, isn't it? There's a name of a pagan goddess Estrogen. from which our word estrogen comes, the female fertility uh, hormone. How did that thing get stuck in, in Christianity? <clears throat> anyway, what happened here was she would baptize, then she would march up to the temple about a half a mile, they would have a big procession, and then she would have sex with the highest level of the temple prostitutes. And while they were smeared with a, a narcotic-laced chrism or an unction, uh, once they were high and flying, then the name of the God was finally given to them, and the mystery or the secrets of that religion were whispered into the ear of these initiates. And so until you got up to the top of that level, uh, you didn't uh, learn the name of the God. So this is, a, this is a pagan doctrine, and this is what the Jews unfortunately picked up in Babylon. They forgot the name of their father. You know what they call people that don't know the names of their fathers. You can't get an inheritance unless you know the name of your father and can establish the paperwork that relates you to the father when he leaves you an inheritance so you can claim that inheritance. Is this yeah. following? This is excellent. Let's pick this up. On the, on the last section. I'll, I'll pull I'll Joe, Joe up back up again. To, to be continued on this. Right. We're going to let Walt 